I'd like to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Um, Walt, uh, for those of you who've been with the club for some time, uh, are, are pretty familiar with Walt. If you've ever been out to the dark site, Walt is pretty much a fixture out there. And, uh, you know, one of the things I've learned about Walt recently is he's done a lot of amazing science out at the dark site. So, uh, Walt is a retired chemical engineer who's been an avid amateur astronomer since the fourth grade when he did a report on the constellation Orion. You know, when I was in fourth grade, I did a constellation on Canis Major because Sirius was my favorite star. So <laughs> these reports are a gateway drug to astronomy. <laughs> um, he was raised in Titusville, Florida, where his dad was an engineer for NASA. And I think we've got a little memento for, of that back in, in the background he'll probably mention. Um, he has a BS chemical engineering from the University of Florida and a master's of science in chemical engineering from Cornell. He's the author or co-author of 45 papers in astronomical journals and discoverer of 64 asteroids and 59 variable stars, including three in Columbus. Is that the latest tally, Walt? Yeah, that, that's the latest tally. Actually, uh, it'll be four when I get the, uh, the, the fourth one published. So oh, nice. th th three still right now. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, asteroid 35365 Cooney was uh, kindly named after Walt by Dr. Petr Pravich of the, and I cannot pronounce this, Andreov Observatory in the Czech Republic. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's guest speaker, uh, Mr. Walt Cooney. Walt. Well, thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. Uh, am I, can you hear me? Am I okay here? We can hear you fine, yes. Okay, great. And let me share the screen. And while you're getting that set up, Walt, I was going to let people know down at the bottom of the Zoom window, we have a chat feature. And if you'd like to ask questions of Walt during the conversation here, during his presentation, uh, feel free to type those in here or just say, I have a question and I'll collect those throughout the, the conversation and I'll call on you afterwards so that uh, you can ask those questions of Walt. So. Okay. Well, again, thanks for coming. I really, really appreciate it. I hope it's an interesting presentation for you. Uh, tonight's topic is cataclysmic variables, stars that go boom. And uh, so, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, supernovae in particular have been recorded in ancient history. We've known about those for a long time. Those, those new stars that get so bright. Uh, there's, hope you can see my mouse here. Yeah. Yes, we can. It's a little okay. small, but we can see it. Okay. Uh, this is a, a Chinese document that's highlighted here where they uh, discuss the, the new star in 1054 AD that we know as now as the Crab Nebula. And then this is a rock carving in India that's been uh, projected against a, a map of the night sky to show here's their version of Orion and here's their version of Taurus and uh, and there was a, a supernova that they saw we believe back in about 3600 BC at least that's one interpretation of that uh, stone carving and then this is something uh, from uh, a, a book showing the 1604 uh, Kepler supernova and this is the constellation Ophiuchus and if you see this this star right here that's got an N uh, a kind of circle that was the location of Kepler supernova in 1604. And so here's what we can show you of those supernovae. I can't show you the supernovae now they have already exploded but we can still see what's left of them and how that's even changing, believe it or not. So this is uh, the supernova that happened in AD 185. This is the remnant and it's, a, it's an infrared picture uh, made with the Spitzer and the WISE space telescopes. This, this remnant is about 8,000 light years away. It has grown to be about 85 light years across at the moment. And the supernova, our best estimates uh, were that it got up to about magnitude minus eight, which is bright enough that it was seen in the daytime. And uh, just for comparison's sake, uh, Venus at its brightest is about minus 4.7. So it was uh, several magnitudes brighter than Venus in the night sky and visible in the daytime. Another one that uh, was recorded is in 1006 AD, this one in Lupus, and uh, 7,000 light years away, uh, 60 light years across at the moment. Uh, 
it got up to magnitude minus seven and so it could also be seen in the daytime and that's quite a beautiful shot of the remnant uh, and this is actually made across multiple spectra this or multiple bandwidths this is a combination of an x-ray image let's see x-ray visual light and and radio all three combined into this kind of a false color image to show those different wavelengths this is the supernova of 1054 that was shown on that Chinese document and uh, it's now our Crab Nebula Hubble Space Telescope picture and 6500 light years away. It's now about 11 light years across and it got up to magnitude minus six and so also uh, visible in daytime. And, and then we had a run on supernovae for a while in 1572 there was one in Cassiopeia and it's called Tycho supernova. And, and this is an interesting shot from the space telescope. So on the left, uh, this, this is actually Chandra's X-ray view of the remnant about 9,000 light years away, 25 light years across. The, uh, the supernova was um, about as bright as Venus, give or take minus four. But on the right is a Hubble Space Telescope picture. And, and so this little star, must be this one in the box here. And as we'll talk about in a minute, supernovae are the result of, of binary stars where one of the stars is a white dwarf and that white dwarf explodes and completely disintegrates. And the, second, the, the secondary star, the other star in the binary pair, now doesn't have a, a companion anymore. It's, it's blown out, and we think we figured out what that's, which star that is, and it's this one. It's, uh, as you notice, it's not in what would be about the center of the remnant. Uh, it's free to travel now that it doesn't have its binary there, and, uh, and, and possibly the supernova blast wave gave it a push in a direction too. Um, so quite quite the neat picture, uh, quite the neat finding. And let me see if I can play a video here. And I'm going to take off full screen. So this is a montage of that supernova in X-ray light from the um, Chandra X-ray telescope. And as you see the year counting up here from 2000 to 2015, and, and I hope you can see this in this web meeting, the, the supernova remnant is still growing. We're, we're watching the movie of it there. Does that come through well enough? Oh yeah, we can see it. Okay, pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. It is. So let's go back to the talk. Okay, so I said we had a run on them. You just mentioned this one in 1572. Just a few years later, we had one at Ophiuchus. That was the one I mentioned. We showed it down in the, in the foot of the constellation. And here are three different images uh, of the, the remnant on the left in X-ray from Chandra with a close-up. And in the middle is what we see visible light. Not, not so much to see in visible light, unfortunately but here's uh, zoomed in a little bit on a portion of that. And then here's infrared with a, a Spitzer Space Telescope and zoomed in again. So this one is about 20,000 light years away. It's about 10 light years across now. And it only got up to magnitude two, uh, minus 2.5. And so that's, that's give or take around uh, as bright as Jupiter gets. And, uh, you know, this one was was quite far away, 20,000 light years. But the other thing that that made this one a little fainter was that uh, we're, we're looking back through a dense portion of the Milky Way and there's a lot of dust between us and where this supernova happened. And so that that dims what we see and also reddens what we see. And so it wasn't as bright as, as some of the others before. And, uh, and by the way, 1604, that's the last one I've got to talk about right now. And so we're due. Uh, we, we're, we're ready for another one to go off in our galaxy soon. Although that said, 
our galaxy doesn't have a monopoly on supernovae. Here's one that went off in the pinwheel galaxy M101 back in 2011. Uh, I imagine at least some of y'all had seen that uh, back in 2011. It got pretty bright, I think, and I don't, okay, yeah, 10th magnitude. And so it, it was easily in reach of, uh, you know, six inch telescope, something like that, no problem. Uh, really smaller telescope than that would have been able to see it. And there, there are literally dozens of these supernovae discovered every year now. Okay, so the, the topic is cataclysmic variables. And we've shown pictures of uh, a bunch of supernovae rem remnants, but there's a whole lot more to cataclysmic variables, a whole lot more kinds of stars that go boom. So we talked about supernovae, we mentioned novae, and some of the other ones that uh, happen or that occur are what are called dwarf novae, recurrent novae, Nova-like variables, polars, intermediate polars, Z-cams, and the list goes on for quite a bit beyond that. And so what are these things? Hopefully some of y'all were able to make the August HAS meeting where Bill Pellerin discussed stellar evolution. And so that's the birth and death of individual stars. And what Bill was talking about, like I say, was individual stars. So what happens if stars are in a binary system? And as you may know, most stars in the universe actually are in binary systems, the, the majority. Uh, our sun is a little bit of an oddball in that it's by itself. And uh, the answer to how they evolve is if these binary stars are widely separated, then they evolve just like two individual single stars. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't interact much. The two stars evolve independently, grow old and, uh, and die as to their course, depending on, on their mass as, as Bill talked about in August. But if the stars are quote close, things change a lot. Now, now they do affect each other. All right, so we gotta take, talk just a little bit about some of the science behind this. And so the, the key concept uh, is what's called a Roche lobe. And so if you look at this graphic, you see these two teardrop looking forms, two teardrop looking shapes around the two stars in a binary system. And so this shape is, is kind of like a, a gravity boundary inside of the surface. Any matter really belongs to that star gravitationally. Outside of the surface, it's really impacted by both stars. It's, um, it, it's well, a difficult concept to explain actually. Um, but the, the critical point for us is there's this thing called the uh, first Lagrangian. And this, actually, I think they call it the Lagrange point rather than Lagrangian, but this is where matter is equally tugged on by this star on the left and this star on the right. And so that's pretty critical in how these close binaries eventually interact and evolve. And here's why. So you end up with a situation where one of the stars has gone, uh, has grown old, has gone from its normal starhood, like our sun is in right now, and it starts moving towards a red giant phase. And when that happens, it expands and it expands to fill its Roche lobe. And, and then matter starts leaking out of that Lagrange point here and moving towards a white dwarf as the second uh, star in the binary. And when the material heads towards this uh, high gravity white dwarf, it, it actually can't just flow directly in. You know, the material coming off the donor, sto donor star has some spin to it. And so angular momentum keeps it from just taking a straight path in. Instead, it spirals in 
to the white dwarf, and we call that an accretion disk. And so to give you a feel for the size of what we're talking about, the typical scale here, the distance between the two stars is something like the Earth-Moon orbital distance. So that's round about 250,000 miles. And the orbital periods are one to 10 hours. And so those things are screaming around each other. You know, the Moon and the Earth uh, revolve around each other uh, once a month. And so one to 10 hours is, is, is just a wee bit faster than that. And so this is, this is the key thing that's happening in cataclysmic variables. So here's an artist's conception of that, a little bit more than just the diagram we, we saw. And so the white dwarf is down here in the center of the accretion disk. And then here's the donor star and the mass stream coming off of it. And where that mass stream first starts to kind of impact the accretion disk, that's actually called the hot spot. And uh, a, a bunch of nuclear nuclear reaction going on there and it uh, flickers and changes brightness over time. So that's uh, kind of an artist's rendition of what your average garden variety cataclysmic variable star really looks like. So here's, here's how we get there. You know, I, I talked about uh, in this cartoon, you, you see we've got two normal stars that are rotating around each other. In this case, they're fairly close to each other. And as stars grow older, the heavier or more massive star ages more quickly and moves into the giant phase. And so that's in this, this next frame here. So this is the heavier massive star starts to expand. Eventually it expands so much that it overflows the Roche lobe and starts draining matter down onto the other star. And then rather than an accretion disk, at this point, what you get is something they call a common envelope. Basically the, um, the, the star that's, that's growing older and expanding kind of engulfs the entire pair. And that, that stage only lasts something on the order of, say, a thousand years, which, as you can imagine, that's, that's less than a blink of an eye in astronomical terms. But, uh, but the thing that happens is the common envelope is ejected from the binary pair. And that's where we get an awful lot of our spectacularly beautiful planetary nebulae. And the reason why so many of those planetary nebulae aren't just these perfect spheres, perfect rings, perfect circles, they have all this strange spirographic um, shape to them. And it's because they're actually from ejected material from binary stars. And so that gravity, that, uh, that rotational inertia that came from that original common envelope and those two stars rotating around each other continues to shape that planetary nebula as it expands from the pair. All right, so once the common envelope is ejected, what we're left with of that big massive star that, was, that had expanded is now just a white dwarf. And, and this is exactly the same thing that's going to happen to our sun. You know, it will, on its lonesome, it will expand. It'll go to a red giant. It'll puff off its outer layers. That'll be a beautiful planetary nebula for somebody else to enjoy. And we'll be left, our sun will be left as a white dwarf. And so we, we have the white dwarf and the original secondary star. Well, the secondary star eventually grows old too. And it expands just like the first one did. And it fills its Roche lobe and it starts leaking mass over onto the white dwarf. And so if you notice one thing that's happened here is, although it's one way the cartoon doesn't do this justice, that the mass flow has reversed. The first thing that happened was this was the first star, the massive star was sending all its material over towards the less massive star. Now it's the less massive star that's 
pushing material over to what's left of the original big one, which is just a white dwarf now. So I, I think that's kind of interesting. I wish they had drawn this cartoon so you could more easily see, so that they kept the stars on the same side of the graphic each time. But, uh, but anyhow, so uh, as the material spirals down into the white dwarf, it builds and builds. And at some point, the white dwarf, which typically might be, say, one solar mass, about as, about as much material as the sun, it grows and it grows as the mass leaks from the other star or is pulled from the other star. And finally, the white dwarf reaches what's called the Trandrasikar limit, which is about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. And at that point, uh, what's called electron degeneracy, which is what was holding that uh, white dwarf from collapsing in on itself. The, the electron degeneracy is finally overcome. There's just too much mass. Gravity has become too powerful. And the result is the star uh, heats up and maybe starts to shrink a little bit, but you get what's called a carbon flash. And so the large amount of carbon that's in this white dwarf now goes into nuclear fusion and, and the star is just plain disintegrated. It is completely wiped out. Uh, there's, there's really nothing left to speak of. And over here in this last frame, you see the, the, the donor star now swinging off into infinity free of its original binary pair there. And, and that's how we get what's called a type 1a supernova. And this is generally what happens across the board in cataclysmic variables. There, there are some variations and that, that gives us different kinds of cataclysmic variables, but this is the, the crux of it. This is the, the outline for how they happen. So a few more words about supernovae. So they'll rise in brightness 15 to 20 magnitudes. And uh, I, as, as you guys may know too, type 1a supernovae have become relatively famous in the astronomy world and maybe even slightly outside the astronomy world too, too because their brightness, their absolute brightness is quite constant. Uh, between different supernovae. And so we have used them as standard candles to tell distances in the universe. And back about uh, 15 years ago, give or take, uh, maybe 20 years ago, uh, two different groups used supernovae explosions to examine the, the rate of expansion of the universe and came up with uh, dark matter and dark energy and all of that kind of bizarre stuff. And they, they got the Nobel Prize, both, of, both groups got the Nobel Prizes for that work. And uh, so these are those, those standard candles. And, and so the funny thing about it is there's actually two ways that we get these type 1a supernovae. And that's, that's kind of the puzzle that's still going on to this day. The, the first one, we just kind of walked you through that cartoon of you get a white dwarf and a cataclysmic variable gains mass. The white dwarf passes the Trandrasikar limit and explodes. And, and the fact that that happens at a defined 1.4 solar masses is why it's kind of a standard candle. You know, it's it's the same amount of mass that goes kablooey each time. So it's the same thousand sticks of dynamite each time, although maybe it's just a little bit more powerful than that. And let me show you, let's see, this is not gonna work, right? No, I'm gonna go here. Okay, so here is an animation out on YouTube of a supernova, type 1a supernova explosion in progress. And so this is the donor star that has uh, expanded, filled its Roche lobe. You see the matter streaming out of the donor star coming down into the uh, accretion disk and spiraling 
down into the white dwarf here at the center. And so let's play this. Oops. Okay, that one was going to go off twice there. Let's see. Okay, so that, that was quite the neat animation. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that music was physically recorded at a supernova. But, uh, but I don't know, it, it could have been. So uh, anyhow, I said though that there, there's not the only, that's not the only way to get a, a supernova, a, a type 1A supernova either. Apparently a lot of supernovas happen because instead of a, a white dwarf and uh, an aging star in a binary pair, you actually have a binary pair of white dwarfs that they merge and pass the Chandrasekhar limit in that merge system and then explode. And the, the, the thing that's quite odd about this though is we talked about 1.4 solar mass as being such a magic number. That's why you get a standard candle because that's how much material explodes. Well, if you've got binary white dwarfs that merge and one of those white dwarfs is about one solar mass and the other one's about 1.1 solar mass and they merge and now you've got an explosion of 2.1 solar masses. And so how is that now still a standard candle? And the answer to that is good question. And that, that's a, an area of active research right now. As a matter of fact, one of the really interesting things that they have seen not too long ago was in 2003, they saw a supernova, a type 1A supernova that was apparently much brighter than it was supposed to be. And they have gone back and tried to work out the theory. And, and this one seems pretty clearly to have been a merger of white dwarfs that combined to substantially more than the 1.4 solar masses. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, this was in 2003, and there was a popular song in that era. And so they actually named that the Champagne Supernova. And there have been several Champagne Supernovas that have gone off since then. And, and they're intensely studied right now. This, this is still something we just really don't understand. And, and it's so critically important because these are our standard candles. This is one of the ways that we get to dark matter and dark energy. So we, we really need to understand them. Okay, well, uh, there are exceptions to the double star cataclysmic variables that I talked about and, and, and those are uh, type 1b, type 1c, and type 2 supernovae, and, and these are different. These are from a single very massive star that grows old very quickly because it's so massive, and then the core collapse, it goes through core collapse as it progresses up through the different levels of fusion, and we, we've seen one of these pretty recently that uh, was actually visible naked eye, although you had to live in the Southern Hemisphere or at least uh, farther south than we are. This was supernova 1987A in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And here to the right is a 1994 Hubble Space Telescope picture of the remnant of this type two supernova. And you can see various rings here. This was material that had been thrown out from the star previous to it going supernova. And then as the radiation now expands violently from where that supernova happened, it's lighting up those rings of material as it passes through them. So, 
All right, so let's go on to another kind of cataclysmic variable, classical novi or just novi. And so these aren't quite as energetic. They don't get quite so bright. Uh, they rise in brightness something like seven to 15 magnitudes, which is still a lot. And so in this variation of that binary star theme that we talked about, we've got hydrogen from the donor star that moves through the accretion disk and then builds a layer of hydrogen right at the white dwarf. And when enough of that hydrogen has built up that hydrogen layer, uh, and not the underlying white dwarf per se, but the hydrogen layer now goes nuclear and is ejected. And so the white dwarf and the companion star both remain behind but part of the white dwarf actually does get ejected too in this energetic explosion. And so here, here's another question that comes up. All right, well, I, I thought the way that we got a, a supernova was mass slowly filtering down from the donor star until the white dwarf got above 1.4 solar masses, and then it all goes kablooey. But the white dwarf loses mass when a nova happens. And so if you get novae first, because the material builds up on near the white dwarf, how do you ever get beyond one point or up to 1.4 1. 1. solar masses to have the supernova? And what I can say to you is good question. And so again, it's something that uh, we don't really understand and there's a lot of research trying to figure that out. Um, here on the right is a, a graphic on a, a picture showing uh, Nova Cygni 1975. I don't know if any of y'all happen to be around and happen to notice this one. I, I was around for it, but I, I don't remember seeing it or looking for it even. Uh, it actually happened uh, in north of Deneb. And so this would be the North American Nebula right over here. And so it was pretty close to the North American Nebula, 1975. And we'll actually mention a few more words about Nova Cygni, 1975 in a bit. All right, well, so what other kinds of cataclysmic variables are, are there? Well, there's dwarf novae. We talked about supernovae, we talked about regular classical novae, and then there's dwarf novae. So these are even smaller. These rise in brightness about two to six magnitudes their outburst, their explosion is different. Now the hydrogen builds down into that accretion disk, but the accretion disk is, a, is an active system and the accretion disk itself can build up matter and ignite. And so it's not the hydrogen layer that's down near the white dwarf, which gives you a nova. This is before you ever get to the white dwarf. So that, that's called a, that gives you a, a, a smaller explosion. And uh, white dwarf, or I'm sorry, dwarf novae can go off quite frequently. Some of them go off uh, every few days. Some of them go off weeks, months, years apart. And, and there's all kinds of other strange things that happen with dwarf novae. There's something called a super outburst. So an outburst that gets even brighter, and that's when the nuclear reactions that are happening in the accretion disk go off, and you get a nuclear energy where the matter is physically falling into the white dwarf. So you get a second bump there. And so these super outbursts are now even brighter than the initial outburst. And, and there's more funny things. There's something called a super hump. And that's on top of a super outburst. You get additional brightenings that show up in a periodic nature. And, and these are caused by deformations, kind of warping of that accretion disk. And another thing to mention is flickering. So this isn't twinkling like we see when we look at a star in our atmosphere. This is actually flickering of the light of this star system. And so it's real short time scale, seconds, minutes, very quickly. And 
it's the matter it's it's two things really at least that's what we think now it's the the nuclear energy being released where the matter is falling into the white dwarf down at the bottom of the accretion disk and it's also some flickering at the hot spot that i showed you out on the edge of the accretion disk where that that matter is falling down onto the accretion disk. The theory until not too long ago was that the flickering was all happening at the hot spot. It was just sitting there basically sizzling with nuclear explosions as that material came from the donor star. And, and we figured out that that's, that's not it, or at least that's not most of it. And the way we know is because sometimes these these binary systems are edge on to us and we can figure out from the light curve where the hot spot is in the light curve and when the hot spot is eclipsed we still see flickering so clearly the hot spot at least isn't the only thing doing it and uh, we, we can further tell because we can see in the light curve where the white dwarf is and where the matter is falling into the white dwarf. So again, just from looking at eclipsing, eclipses and that geometry and those light curves, we can figure out that the flickering is, is coming from both with most of it, we believe coming right at the white dwarf itself. So anyhow, lots of stuff here. There's even more things, but I wanted to give you some flavor of all these interesting and strange things that happen in these uh, in these binary systems and we can physically see these in in our light measurements and speaking of which here's some light measurements these are aavso curves uh, light curves uh, contributed by amateurs to the american association of variable star observers and you can get on the web and pull these anytime you like pull these curves ss signi is a dwarf nova it's one of the prototypical dwarf novae and and the x-axis here is days and julian days actually and so here's 400 here's 500 here's 600 so in about 100 days this this star goes faint and bright and faint and bright three or four times in 100 days i, I think nominally they call it a, a 22 day period Although you'll notice it, it doesn't do that like clockwork. There, there's a fair bit of variation here. It kind of stalled out a little bit uh, fainter, although not as faint as it could be. And, and something else to mention on these, on these graphs is these measurements are made by amateurs and the black circles are made by amateurs with uh, modest telescopes and their eyeball. Those are visual, uh, variable star magnitude estimates. And we've got folks active in our club who do that. Uh, I mentioned Brian Kudnick in particular is an incredibly active AAVSO member who is, has contributed uh, tremendous numbers of uh, these light or these uh, magnitude estimates of variable stars. But in the green are amateur measurements with telescopes with CCV cameras or DSLRs for that matter. And one thing that's important to notice is, you know, the CCDs and the visual observers really agree pretty closely and the visual observers are, are doing tremendous work. Uh, you could certainly argue that the CCD can be very, very accurate, but it's amazing how good the human eye can be at doing this as well. Okay, so let's go down. Uh, SU Ursa Majoris is another dwarf nova. And I wanted to show you this one because this is one that has the super outbursts I talked about. And so he, here are the regular up and downs where it's going through normal outbursts. And then every so often it has a super outburst. And if you remember, that's when you get the addition, not just of the accretion disk lighting up, but you also get the matter falling into the white dwarf lighting up brightly. Let's go on. There's another one. We talked about Novi. Well, Novi don't necessarily go off just once. Uh, 
recurrent novae are a thing too. There are 10 of them that we know of so far in our galaxy. And, you know, we think there's a whole lot more than that, but we've only been watching for, you know, 100, 200 years, something like that. And so these are the only ones that we know of so far. This is the list and this shows when they have erupted the years that we saw them go off. And I'll, I'll point out two of them in particular that are kind of interesting. Here's one, T picks. So this one would go off pretty regularly. So here's 12 years, 18 years later, 24 years later, 23 years later, and then nothing for a long time. There was a long gap. And so right in this time frame, about 25 years, maybe 30, 35 years after 1967, that's when astronomers started writing papers about why this star apparently would never go nova again. And then they had to throw those papers away because it went off in 2011. So, you know, uncooperative star for sure. And, and I'll mention another one, that's U Scorpi. And so this one has gone off many times. And uh, uh, an LSU astronomy professor, Brad Schaefer, has spent a lot of time working on this one. And he put out uh, a plea for help to the AAVSO asking folks to watch out for this one going off. Uh, this was in 2019 he did that because his calculation said it should go off any time now and we just need to keep an eye out. Well, so several folks, well, a, a lot of folks actually answered the call and it didn't go off and it didn't go off and it still hasn't gone off, but we think it did go off. We think it went off in 2016 or 2017, but Scorpius is along the ecliptic. And so we think it probably went off in about November when the sun was sitting right between us and it. And so there was no way we could have seen it. And so we just missed it. And I'll talk a little bit that more uh, later. I've actually done some of the work, uh, me and several other folks in the club, to, to find out what's going on with that star. All right, Z-CAMS. That's a, that's a strange name. So the very first one discovered of this type is Z. Camelopardalis. And so they're now all called Z cams for short. And these are regular dwarf novae that do their regular outbursts. But then at some point, they're on their way down and they get stuck. And they sit there and kind of sizzle around at the same magnitude for weeks or months. And then they get started again until they get stuck again and sizzle around at the same magnitude for an extended period of time. And, and this is a recent light curve. Right now, it's, it's still stuck. And so this, this is another area of research. Why in the world does something that goes off regularly, regularly kind of get caught in the middle? All right, this is another strange one. So Nova-like variables. So these are non-eruptive cataclysmic variables. These are cataclysmic variables that don't have cataclysms. So, so how did we ever even discover them? How do we ever even decide that they're truly cataclysmic variables? Well, we see that because the spectroscopy shows us something is going on. They, they resemble or they act just like cataclysmic variables uh, spectroscopically, even if we don't see them go off. And so we think what's going on with these is there's a lot of matter that's being pulled down from that donor star and sucked into the accretion disk. And so basically the accretion disk is always an outburst. And, and that's why we see these as, as uh, never outbursting because they're always outbursting. And here's an AAVSO graph, but I kind of cheated on this one. So this is magnitude. It normally sits around magnitude 12.9, about magnitude 13 here. 
but then it's got these things where it drops almost a full magnitude down to about 13.8. And so this is one of those uh, cataclysmic variable stars I was talking about that's line of sight edge on to us. And so this is an eclipse. This is the white dwarf and the accretion disk being hidden by that donor star. And so one of the things you can figure out from that is the donor star must be about this bright because that's all we're seeing. Normally the white dwarf and the accretion disk far outshine the donor star, donor star so we, we don't get to see much of it. But, but now they're hidden. Now we can look at it directly and see what's going on with it. More strangeness. These are polars. Now you've got the case where the white dwarf has a spectacular magnetic field. The, the Earth's magnetic field is about 0.5 Gauss. The sun at its surface magnetic field is about one Gauss, not that much. These, these white dwarfs have magnetic fields on the order of 10 to 80 million Gauss. And that magnetic field is so strong that you can't actually form an accretion disk. If you look over here to this, this graphic, here's the donor star. Here's the material leaking towards the white dwarf. And at some point, before you ever get to form an accretion disk, this super powerful magnetic field grabs a hold of that matter and sucks it in on the magnetic poles of the white dwarf. And so these are called polars. And, and by the way, to polar, uh, it, it's not because it pulls the matter in to the pole. It's because one of the ways we can tell this is a polar is because the light coming from this system is polarized. And that's an effect of being pulled into this magnetic field here. And so that's, that's where they get their names. But um, here, here's the prototypical uh, polar. And it does have outbursts. In this case, it's, it's going about two magnitudes from normal, normal brightness up to full brightness. But they keep getting stranger. So this is an intermediate polar. So now we have a white dwarf with a super powerful magnetic field, but not quite as powerful as the last one. Uh, the magnetic field here is one to 10 million Gauss. And so you get a pretty cool thing. Now you've got the donor star, the material being pulled from it comes down. It does form an accretion disk that spirals around the white dwarf. But eventually, the white dwarf's magnetic field is strong enough to grab a hold of the matter in the accretion disk and pull it up and over and down in the magnetic poles of the white dwarf. And so that's why it's called an intermediate polar is it's kind of intermediate magnetism and its accretion disk is a donut. It, it sweeps clean this inner portion of the accretion disk. And so here's the, the most well-known intermediate polar. And again, I cheated. These, this one is edge on to us. And so we're seeing the eclipses where the white dwarf is, is going behind the donor star. Okay, so, so where are we going now? How do amateurs get involved? What's important with all of this? And, and actually, why, why don't I skip down to this bullet? Uh, why do we even care? It's interesting, sure, fascinating to see these stars that go explode and why the, trying to figure out why they're doing that. But, but there is more to it than that. It turns out these are just really great laboratories to understand how accretion disks work in astronomy. Because as you saw, a lot of these phenomena and cataclysmic variables happen on timescales of hours, days, weeks, months, years. While a lot of accretion disk activity in astronomy is much, much, much longer time scales. For instance, black hole accretion disks, planetary formation is an accretion disk phenomena that takes, takes place over very long time scales. 
And so as we investigate and try to understand how accretion disks function, function in cataclysmic variables, it, it lends understanding to a lot of other important accretion disks physics out there in the universe. And so some of the things that we're trying to understand specifically up to the higher bullet is uh, how do we really get to that type, way, type 1a supernova? I talked about how there's some real uncertainties there. And, and this one's pretty interesting too. So in reality, are dwarf novae, novae, nova-like variables, are, these, are they really all the same thing, just at different snapshots, different, different times? in their evolution? And, and we don't know the answer to that, although we, we think the answer is probably yes. Although it's gonna be a really complicated answer with a lot, of, lot more than just some simple, uh, simple progression, I'm sure. Uh, are all novi recurrent? We talked about there's 10 recurrent novi that we know about now. Well, we haven't been looking that long. And there's a lot of good theory that says that really all novi are recurrent. Now they may not go off again for another thousand years or another 10,000 years, but uh, they, they're not just a, a, single, a single time happening. More things, and I, I didn't really get into this stuff, but just to mention a few things, odd stuff that goes on there, things called negative super humps. There's period bouncing. There's a period gap, I, I told you where the typical orbital periods of the white dwarf and the donor star are one to 10 hours. And that's true, but between two and three hours, there are almost none. So there's something strange going on there and we've actually got some theories why that is. And, and I also mentioned flickering. You know, we, it hasn't been that long ago, we finally figured out that flickering isn't happening where we think it was. It's, it's not at the hot spot. It's mostly down at the white dwarf itself. Amateur research, that was one of the things I wanted to be sure and mention here is so what, what are we as amateurs, what can we do to contribute? There's a hugely active um, uh, group of people in amateur astronomy doing work in this, both visual and CCD. I, I mentioned I mentioned Brian Kudnick in our local group who's who's done visual work. I, I, I'm sure there are others, and I'm sorry for not mentioning your names. Uh, I, there are several folks doing CCD, uh, uh, cataclysmic variable work for the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And, and so that's an organization that, that collects data from amateurs makes that data available to the professional astronomers and professional astronomers have used that data as a tremendous resource to learn a lot of things write a lot of papers over the years some of the advantages are we get multi-year and multi-decade light curves we've got light curves for stars going back before 1900 and so you can really see what's happening with with some kind of longevity as opposed to the professional normally getting two nights on the telescope next year. Another thing amateurs are doing is we're the sentinels for these outbursts. So when the recurrent novae go boom again, uh, novae like USCO, uh, T Corona Borealis, T Pix, those, uh, it, it's the amateurs watching for those. Now, now pros watch too, but amateurs are often the, one, often the ones who really catch them first. And that's historically been very much the case. And we're also watching for other outbursts. There's a, a really interesting one that happened this spring where there's a, a black hole binary. Uh, it's now called V3720 Ophiuchus. And it flared this spring and got really bright and it's had a couple of flare-ups since then. And uh, professional astronomers are scratching their heads and the amateurs are helping provide the data so that they can try to figure out what's going on. Another important bit, and I've been involved with this a little bit, it's pretty neat to be able to say that you're supporting the Hubble Space Telescope. And that, that's a little grandiose, but there is there is a little bit of truth to it. The Hubble Space Telescope and major observatories do cataclysmic variable research all the time. 
but but they get short sessions. They get a night, they get two nights. Maybe if they're really lucky, they get a week um, at a major observatory or two hours on the Hubble Space Telescope. A and that, that gives them a great snapshot, but the amateur work over longer time periods allows them to put that work in perspective, see what, what else that star system had been doing. And actually, we're helping protect the Hubble Space Telescope. And what I mean by that is there's an uh, instrument on the Hubble Space Telescope called the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, the COS. And it's a spectrograph that's sensitive to ultraviolet light. And so it's a very critical instrument to a lot of what Hubble has done. And it's used a lot for uh, cataclysmic variable research. The unfortunate thing is it has a brightness limit. If the object it's observing is too bright, it'll literally damage the instrument. And it would be great not to damage the instruments on the Hubble Space Telescope. And so generally astronomers working on cataclysmic variables with Hubble Space Telescope don't want to image when an outburst is going on. They don't, they don't want to see it explode. They want to see it at quiescence. And if it explodes during a run or just before a run, you're liable to damage that instrument. And so through the AAVSO, the professionals request that the amateurs monitor the particular targets, post their data. And usually within about 24 hours, the professional astronomers have to give the Hubble Space Telescope uh, Institute a go, no go decision on that observation. And it, it's kind of neat. What they actually do is what's fed up into the telescope menu a week or two beforehand is an observation of the wrong field. And it's not until they get this go signal from the pros looking at the amateur data a day before that they will upload the true target to take place take the place of that uh, dummy target that was just a safe target. And, and, and just this past spring, as a matter of fact, the Hubble Space Telescope was going to observe a, a cataclysmic variable and amateurs were uh, able to say, stop. Uh, not, not too long before they were supposed to uh, point Hubble towards it, it did go into outburst. And so they, they canceled the observation. They rescheduled it. Uh, actually, and I think the observation just happened about a month or six weeks ago, and uh, amateurs were again looking. This time it did not go off. This time they did have a, a successful observation. There's another really prominent way that amateurs are contributing in, in cataclysmic variable research, and that's what's called the Center for Backyard Astrophysics. And it's run by a professor of astronomy at Columbia University up in New York, Dr. Joe Patterson. And he was wise enough to realize that while the pros only get these short time periods on these long on these large telescopes, a lot of what happens to understand you really need to see it over longer time scales, and you even need to see it. Uh, uh, across a 24-hour period. And so by having a global group of amateurs who collaborate with him, we will watch the particular targets and put light curves together that get around this, this uh, limit of only seeing it for five hours every 24 hours. We can actually watch it to, to some extent all day for weeks or months. And so this has been going on since 1991. That's when he first started it. Uh, telescopes that participate range from eight inch to 29 inch aperture. So, it, and, and there's only one 29 inch. Most of them are way closer to the eight inch, eight, 12 inch is, uh, 12 inch is probably about the, the average, I would think. And uh, something else, you know, this has been going on since 1991. And so the CBA now has multi-year, multi-decade coverages of CVs. And so we're able to get the 
to changes that happen over those time frames. And so let me let me show you one down here without without going too deep into this. But this is ES SETI. And this is what's called an O minus C diagram. Uh, it, it's basically a way you can graph, uh, show on a graph whether uh, an orbit is slowing down or speeding up. And in this case, because what they say is, is the teacup filling or is the teacup draining? You know, is the parabola going up or down? In this case, the teacup is, is filling. And so that tells us that the orbit is actually, the orbital period is actually getting longer. And on the face of it, that's a little strange because normally stars in pairs spiral closer to each other over time. They don't, they don't grow farther apart over time. So some interesting physics going on with that. And, and this, this work is, you know, over the 16 year period to see this effect. Something else all this data can do is we can see past the flickering. You know, flickering is a neat phenomenon. We don't truly understand it, but it's also a pain because our light curves have all this, what seems like noise. You know, when, when someone first looks at a variable, a variable star, a cataclysmic variable star light curve, they say, boy, was your telescope out of focus? What was wrong? And in, in fact, it's the flickering that just is, is uh, makes the curves noisy. But you get lots of people working on the same star and you combine all of that, you can average out the flickering and you can get an amazing light curve like this one, HP Libra. And so this is its orbital light curve. And look at the amplitude, 13, magnitude 13.698 to magnitude 13.703, five one thousandths of a magnitude. And, and no, nobody's individual telescope did this. But when you put lots of telescopes together and you have the advantage of statistics, you, you could do some pretty amazing things. So lots of papers have been published out of this. Uh, I'm sure it's more than 100 for sure over the years. And, and it's still a very active group. And so I help with uh, both AAVSO and the Center for Backyard Astrophysics. Here's just a quick few light curves to look at. This first one is of HP Libra. Okay, I cheated again. This is even another kind of cataclysmic variable star that I didn't list, I didn't talk about. This one is two white dwarfs. They, they call this a, a helium binary that the, the, the um, accretion disk instead of hydrogen being pulled from the donor star is helium being pulled from the other star and so that's its light curve you see uh, just a pretty small amplitude and lots of up down up down going on with this one v1080 for hercules we don't know if this is a nova like or an intermediate polar trying to figure that out VZ sex, we sextons, we think this is an intermediate polar as well, but work still to be done. And, and I'll mention another group doing this. Uh, Bill Flanagan, uh, Bill Pellerin and I support a telescope out near Medina in the hill country. And we have used that telescope to do cataclysmic variable work. And so here's a light curve. This is U Scorpi. This is that uh, cataclysmic variable recurrent nova that I mentioned that we thought maybe went off in 2016 or 2017 and we'd already missed it. And so this is a part of the eclipse. This is another one where it's edge on towards us so we can actually see an eclipse. And by timing the bottom of these eclipses, we can figure out whether it has already gone off or not. And, and the answer from the data so far is that yes, like I said, probably 2016 or 2017. And our continued work, we should be able to figure out from this, this analysis, whether it actually went off in November of 2016 or November of 2017. 
uh, we don't have enough data to say for sure yet. Here's another light curve. This is that Nova Cygni 1975 that I mentioned. This is the one that w went off near the, the North American Nebula. And so here's its light curve bouncing around doing doing strange things. And when you when you put this together with many more light curves from many folks, you can start to figure out what's going on. And then the last one to mention V392 Persei. We talked about our cataclysmic variables, all these kinds of cataclysmic variables, just snapshots of system of the same kind of system doing different things at different times. And here's some pretty good evidence for that. V392 Persei was a dwarf nova that we'd known about for some time. And 2018, the thing went nova. So there you go. At least we've got one example, and actually there's potentially a second example, but here's one example of a dwarf nova that at some point went nova. And we mentioned that novae potentially happen all the time too, so maybe that connects dwarf novae, novae, and recurrent novae all together. So anyhow, more, more to figure out, more to learn. Thank goodness we got the professional astronomers to do the detailed analysis on that, to tell you the truth. Okay, that's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I hope this was interesting for you, and I'd love to answer any questions if I can. Hey, Walt, thank you very much. That's a, a fascinating talk, and I think one of those areas where you kind of really highlights the fact that astronomy is still one of those sciences where amateurs in many regards are still leading the way, right? Uh, kind of the tip of the yeah. spear. For, for a lot of the work that the professionals are doing. So thank you. Yeah, you know, the, the professionals are limited with those big telescopes on the mountains. They only get those little snapshots and the amateurs can do things that the professionals really just can't do now. Right, okay. I had one question before we actually went into the rest of the ones that came into the uh, chat room. So we had about uh -oh, seven or eight uh -oh. there. Oh boy. <laughs> so, I've read recently that uh, there's actually a prediction of a supernova that would be visible in Cygnus in 2022. Have you heard about that at all? So it's the first prediction of a supernova, they said. I, I did read about that. Uh, I, I don't remember the details, but you know what I have read since then was further analysis says, mm, yeah, probably not. Okay, I've heard kind yeah. of the same thing. There, there are quite a few skeptics on the other side saying probably not. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and the skeptics are, are are not just your usual skeptics, right? The, these are these are professional astronomers who've looked at the data and said, well, you're interpreting it one way, but we think this is really the right way to interpret it. And right. I, I, I wish I could remember some more detail, but it, it seems like it's a maybe not. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll keep our eyes open in 2022. Okay. Anyway, yeah, just yeah. In case. <laughs> That'd be great. We're we're due a supernova. We're due, right? So, all right. I think Bill Spaziri was the first one to chime in. Bill, if you're uh, you're out there, you want to take yourself off mute? Go ahead and ask. If not, I can I can ask for you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think. Uh, the question, uh, the first question I asked was, uh, you mentioned uh, very early on in the presentation about a binary pair, the typical type 1A, where you have a star go to red giant and the white dwarf is nearby, and that they'd be apart, but uh, similar to the, uh, their separation would be similar to the Earth moon distance. Right. But right, right. when I hear, oh, our sun's going to go red giant and it's going to uh, uh, become larger than the orbit of Mercury, uh, Venus. Earth, or maybe even larger, which is way more than 240,000 miles. And so I, I was surprised to hear such a small distance uh, for the size of a red giant. Yeah, it, it, really, the, the key bit there is the, the size of the red giant. And, and what I mean by that, what's the actual mass of the red giant? Because if the red giant is, is a solar mass, a, a, a star with only 0.05 solar masses, then that red giant isn't so giant. Right. And, and so that, that's the key bit there is usually this, uh, this second companion is a dwarf, a dwarf star. And, right. and I didn't mention that. And, uh, and then, of course, it, it's a red giant, but with the, the caveat that it's got this whole Roche lobe problem so that it doesn't, mm. It doesn't keep growing and keep growing. The matter starts filtering off of it. 
and so the giant hood in that sense is uh, has a boundary to it. So it has the characteristics of a red giant, but not the the mass and the uh, diameter of a other big, really big red giants. Yeah, they're generally smaller than our okay. our sun, and a lot of the mass that would it would have grown, or a lot of the size it would have grown to, has been lost just because that matter instead gets pulled down into the white dwarf. It's been stolen, right? Okay, right. great. Thank you. Right, right. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next question was from Kenneth Drake. Draco, uh, I think he said his microphone is offline, but I'll ask for him. He said, uh, how close would a supernova have to be to Earth to be dangerous? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Um, you know, Betelgeuse is something like 500 light years right. away, and I have heard different different ideas on that from different astronomers. Some say that that's far enough and we're okay. And some say, oh, no, 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 we're, we're in trouble if Betelgeuse goes. So I, I'll, uh, I'll throw myself at the mercy of the fact the pros don't necessarily know either. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's, uh, there's evidence to say that perhaps some of the mass extinction events that we've had here on Earth may be related to uh, supernova uh, explosions as well, right? Yeah, well, and if you want to throw that open to other folks who, who know about that subject who maybe can shed a little more light on it than I can. Um... Okay, yeah, we'll get to that at the end, if, if that's okay with okay. you. Okay. All right, uh, Blanca Bejar, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Blanca, did you want to come off mute and ask your questions? Okay, uh, yes. Uh, yes, I have technically two questions. And the first one is about the colors of the supernovae. If they are true colors, I mean, the myriad of colors are true because I have heard that they uh, retouched the photographs. So I don't know if it's true or not to see those. Yeah, okay. Colors. No, I, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, we'll, we'll see here. It's very true that a lot of what, a lot of the, the beautiful pictures that you see in astronomy aren't aren't really exactly what they look like uh, for instance uh, you know some of those supernova remnant pictures i showed with the beautiful colors well th those were those were fake colors you know the some of them had x-ray radio and visible light all combined into the picture and so as part of producing that quote unquote picture they'll assign say blue to x-ray and green to visual light and red to radio and, and you get the beautiful colors and, and it's it's helpful to see that because you can visualize it in all those wavelengths but of course in fact we we can't really see the object like that so so maybe maybe that's what you're getting at um, i have another question what makes recurrent the supernovae or novi what makes them uh, to burst or outburst again? I mean, they burst, they lose matter, energy, and they, they come back to normal, and then what happens? It, well, still, still active research. It's a good question. And uh, I think the answer is that if you remember, the material uh, works its way through the accretion disk. The hydrogen then builds up as a layer you know, a, a boundary layer above the white dwarf because it can't easily drop into the white dwarf. It's still got angular momentum that it's got to deal with. And, and so it, it kind of builds up into a traffic jam right there at that boundary layer until it goes off, goes nova. We talked about it actually takes a little bit of the mass of the white dwarf with it. But so then it goes back to normal and the donor star continues to lose mass, which continues to drop down in the accretion disk, which can once again build up, have a traffic jam at the boundary layer of the white dwarf and go nova again. So, so that's the reason is there's a, a continuing supply of, of material coming off the donor star. Excellent. Thanks for those uh, answers. Uh, Bram Weissman, I think you had a question as well. Yeah, Walt, um, are there variable stars that don't have companions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and thanks for mentioning that, Bram. Uh, 
in fact, this is just one subgroup of the massive number of uh, massive kinds, massive number of kinds of variable stars out there. You know, there are there are Myras, which are individual stars that that go super giant and then they pulse and they change color and they change brightness. And there are our Lyries, which pulse uh, individual stars pulse, change color, change brightness. There are Cepheid variables that do something similar, uh, Delta Scooties, um, gosh. There's a long list of other kinds of variables, and I probably should have mentioned that to give people that perspective. This is just the one subgroup that happens to be interesting because uh, these are, are very irregular and, and they go boom. They, they give off a lot of energy when they go off. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. And then uh, Glenn Lubians, I believe you had a question as well. Yes. Uh, no, it feels plausible that you have in a uh, in the binary where the donor star is accreting material, or the dwarf is accreting material from the disk onto its service, that you have the fusion there. But this idea of fusion in the accretion disk itself seems quite odd. After all, we're using really high powered lasers on lithium hydride pellets trying to create fusion in our labs and we're having a lot of difficulty with it. What's going on in the accretion disk that retains or actually maybe converts the gravitational energy into thermal energy in combination with sufficient density to cause fusion? Yeah, yeah, fantastic question. The subject of many, many, many research papers and PhD theses over the years. And, and I can give you an answer at, at some level. I, I, I don't know enough about it to give the, the hugely detailed answer, but the, the bottom line is uh, the, the accretion disk is normally fairly transparent. Uh, by transparent, I mean uh, light from the accretion disk can pass through the accretion disk and out into space without too much difficulty. And, and so the accretion disk uh, can hold a, a reasonable temperature. But at some point, the accretion disk in some small area that then expands will turn opaque. And there, there are a number of mechanisms at play. Uh, there is uh, gravitational radiation, there's magnetic braking, there, there's all kinds of things just to throw out some of, the, some of the fancy terms. But the bottom line is a portion of the accretion disk will heat up extremely and then go opaque. And when it goes opaque, now the radiation from, from the uh, accretion disk is, is more or less trapped, and so it continues to heat up, and it eventually it heats up to the point where it, it does go nuclear, and, and there are also density waves in the accretion disk. You know, we, we really didn't talk about, but the accretion disk is a spectacularly complex system. Uh, I, I've read through, you know, paged through <laughs> some of the books on the accretion disk physics and uh, ju just spectacularly complex things going on there. And uh, so I, I can't answer you directly other than to say that that's kind of the mechanism is there's kind of a low state where the accretion disk is mostly transparent and cooler and the high state, the outburst state where the accretion disk is hot and opaque and and goes off. So I, I hope that kind of answers. Yeah, that's a partial answer. answer. Okay. Sir, thank you. Sure. Uh, so it's not really increasing the density to anything that we would experience here on Earth. But I, the I don't think so. The temperatures right. are going bizarre in in certain portions of the disk. I, I I think that's right. There are most definitely density fluctuations. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I don't think it ever gets to the kind of densities uh, that, that you might be talking about otherwise. Although, to tell you the truth, it, it's something I need to spend a little time looking at and, and be sure I know the answer to that. That's a good question. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you have time for one more question, Walt? Oh, sure. Okay. I think Don Anderson had uh, 
a question she wanted to ask as well. Don, are you out there? Uh, hi, um, I've got a question about the uh, dark energy in the dark matter. Um, and um, I read up a little bit about this. And uh, there's been some physicists that have studied and said that the dark matter could provide the extra gravitational energy needed for a supernova explosion. And there was also discussion about the asymmetric uh, dark matter in the uh, type uh, 1A supernova and uh, uh, the dark energy. And um, also the WIMPs, though I think they don't think they really have anything to do with this. Uh, it's a complex subject. I've done a lot of reading on it over the year, years. I've subscribed to physics world for a long time. And I'm just kind of interested in your opinions on all those subjects. Well, I'd have to admit to you, I, I'd be out of my depth to offer an opinion. Uh, I, I really haven't spent too much time trying to uh, to look at that. I, I know there are those discussions. It's, it's really interesting to think about dark matter uh, and its interplay with the matter that we do see and, and how it's manifesting in actual things and not just being dark. But I, I, I don't have, it, it sounds like you're better informed about it than I am, no, honestly. No, I, I just, I've just read about it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm all open to whatever you... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just really don't know. I mean, those are great questions and it's, it's a, another example of, of, how much we still have to learn and how little we we actually do know right now okay thank you very much mm -hmm. great presentation by the way. thank you thanks all right well i did have one other question i know most of these systems were uh double star systems are there any things more exotic than that triple star quadruple star systems any any novae coming coming out of those types of systems or uh you know not that i know of uh, but i'm sure that's the wrong answer <laughs> it just popped into my head. I was thinking, well, you know, I wonder if there's, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I really haven't read about that. I've kind of wondered the same thing. You, you've got to believe that there is such a thing. Sure. I, I will I will say, though, that when you get to things like triple star systems, multiple star systems, usually the physics of the gravity right. there means that the three aren't all close to each other. You know, those those kinds of systems wouldn't be stable. Right. So a triple star system, I think, might be two close ones and then the third one quite a distance away. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, hey, Walt, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your, your presentation. It was a, a fantastic presentation. I think for many of you, uh, I hope you'll do what I do is uh, get on the AAVSO.org website after this and, and do a little more uh, research to figure out how we can contribute as amateurs to this. So uh, thank you again, Walt. I, I do appreciate it. And uh, thank, thanks, Joe. My... Right. You're welcome. Sure. Let me share my screen here. Um, Very interesting, Walt. Thanks, Bill. All right. So I did lie earlier. I said the meetings were November 4th and November 5th. They are November 5th and November 6th. So next month's novice meeting uh, will be on November 5th, uh, my birthday again, at 7 p.m. And then we will have our general meeting on November 6th at 7 p.m. So if you have any questions, want to learn more about the club, uh, you can visit our website at uh, astronomyhouston.org. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, if you do any of the social media things, then uh, our, our social media links are there. Astronomy Houston, uh, Houston Astronomical Society on Facebook, at Houston Astro Sock on Twitter, and Astronomy Houston on Instagram. And if you have any questions about anything related to the club, you can always email us at info at astronomyhouston.org, and we'd love to answer those questions for you. So uh, until then, we will see you November 5th. And uh, for those of you who are going to be joining us on October 23rd for the All Clubs meeting, uh, we'll see you beforehand. So appreciate the time, everybody. Thanks again, Walt. Do appreciate the, uh, the, the very, very interesting uh, discussion here, and we'll see you all soon.